Thank you guys so much for, uh, for having me here today. So today I'm going to talk about a lot of things, but the most important thing is I'm going to talk about brain over brawn. It's a very important thing. This is a room filled with smart people. We're going to talk about smart things or brain over brawn, AKA how dumb America finally caught up to smart us. That's us. Cause this is a room filled with smart people. And I'm allowed to say that cause I'm an American and that's my country and we're a little slow, but give us some time. We're a young country. So, America's given us amazing things. America gave us the, the steam turbine, an incredible invention, changed the world, changed travel. They gave us air travel. If it wasn't for the plane, we wouldn't even be here, half of us. It gave us the one thing that actually gave us all careers, motion pictures. God bless Thomas Edison. But to be fair, America also gave us spray on hair, <laughs> something I will need very soon. It also gave us Snuggies for dogs. And it gave us the greatest presidential candidate the world has ever seen. <laughs> but simultaneously, in giving us these magical things, America also gave us a never-ending stream of questionable content. Shows that kind of set the tone worldwide of what was to come. But, to be fair, it made a lot of money. As our good friend P.T. Barnum said, no one ever went broke underestimating the intelligence of the American public. It's very true. So on the heels of all that success and all that money, what happened? Well, we franchised it out to everyone around the world. We spread this magic to everyone. And on the heels of all this success, all of this money making came an onslaught of low-brow, low-rent, low-bar programming. But... Well, the times, they are changing. Bob is right. They are. Thank you, Bob Dylan, for saying that decades ago. And it began, ultimately, about 15, 16 years ago. TV networks started saying, why can't we create content that's on par with Hollywood movies? Why can't we make things that are on the same level of these types of shows, these types of movies? And they said, let's do that. Let's do what movies have done for TV. And it began with HBO, places like Showtime, FX. FX, who took one of the biggest risks, because ultimately these were subscription networks. They didn't have to bow down to advertisers. FX saying, well, why can't we compete with what these subscription services are doing and do the exact same thing? Why can't we raise that same bar? And they did, across the board. What started to happen on the heels of that was a revolution. The smartest content you've ever seen suddenly hitting television and changing what we thought about television. Changing the way we looked at content in a way that was remarkable. And on the heels of this, on the heels of all these networks that started doing that, every other network started saying, well, we should do the same thing. Why can't we create a show that lives on that same level? Why can't we compete with those? We're a commercial network. We should be doing the exact same thing as a place like FX, HBO, Showtime. And they did. If you look at the landscape now in the United States, every single network, no matter who they are, has at least one, if not two, high profile, huge shows that are getting mega audiences that are smart, that are compelling, that are challenging viewers in a way that's never happened. Even pop. Pop, which used to be the TV Guide channel in the United States, has Schitt's Creek. Schitt's Creek, a bona fide hit for Pop, which is getting over a million viewers in every single episode. But the networks in the middle of this revolution were doubling down on the lowbrow programming. They said, hold on. This is cheap. We're going to keep making this nonfiction content. We're going to make more Swamp Court. We're going to make more paranormal design. Hard to believe these actually aren't real shows. But who wouldn't want to watch a show where a ghost redesigns my kitchen? That shit's crazy. That's the world we were living in. And as they continued to double down on shows like this, what happened to networks? Oh, people fled. Viewership went away. As the rising tide and the, and the rising tide lifted all the ships of fiction programming, it was not happening in nonfiction programming. But on the heels of this was when people mm. suddenly said, oh. mm. Mm. <sighs> Why? Mm. Hmm. Yes. 
Why? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Why? Hmm. I'm confused. Why? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Greatest meme ever, by the way. It makes you want to shoot your television in the face when you would watch some of this stuff on television. What can we do to change this environment, to change this landscape? And people said, well, we should take risks. We should start to change what's happening. We can do that. And the people who started to say, we can take the risks and take the chances were the ones that led the charge into fiction entertainment. It were the same networks that said, we don't have to answer to anyone else. We can push the envelope and do things that no one else is doing. And on the heels of that, it was places like HBO, Netflix, BBC, who said, we're going to make things different. We're going to make things that are smarter, that are bigger, that are better, that will challenge audiences. And audiences watched. They flocked. They gathered in droves to see things that weren't being given to them. We were, we were setting up audiences with all of the fiction programming that weren't being delivered in nonfiction. So suddenly came this expectation of, well, why can't we do this? Why can't everyone else do this? And now that's what's exciting for all of us. As nonfiction producers, we are now in a place where more people are watching nonfiction entertainment than ever before. More people are watching what we make than ever before because they have access to it in places that have never happened in the entire history of the planet. No matter where you go, you suddenly have access to nonfiction in a way that has never been possible. More people watch the things that I make on Netflix than I've ever heard of. People are texting me, emailing me, tweeting me every day. It's phenomenal, it's exciting. And now, this is happening around the world. And on that, as a result, what's next? More people will start watching smarter nonfiction entertainment than ever before. There will be an abandonment of what's happened in the past, and more people will now start pushing towards smarter nonfiction content and doubling down. Why? Because the price point is still the same. It doesn't matter if you're making something with a guy in a swamp versus somebody who's at a university. It's going to cost you the same thing, and it's going to be equally as compelling because now audience will want to see it. Audiences will want to see more, and they'll want more smarter nonfiction content. If you look at what's happened, this is what I find to be the greatest thing ever. TV production, TV viewing has continued to go down while digital has exploded. It's huge. This is like through 2014. 2015 was about 53, 54%. More than half of the people are consuming all of their content now digitally. They're watching it on tablets. They're watching it on their phones. They're watching it on their computers. And on the heels of that makes this question, well, where do I focus my time and effort? As a producer, what do I do? Where should I be making things? And for me, it's very easy. If you look at this, of where people are focusing their time, here are 55-year-olds, right here. 55-year-olds ultimately are still seeing above half of their stuff on television. As you go below that, more and more people are consuming digitally. So for me, it's a digital focus. We should all be focusing our production efforts on how do we start to transition into a digital marketplace in a way that is, that is accessible, that is easy, and is the best economic, makes, makes the most economical sense for all of us. And this is the biggest point. Today, no matter who you are, no matter what you produce, your production strategy has to contain a digital strategy. It has to. For far too long, people have said, well, I'm just going to keep making movies. I'm going to keep making TV shows. Great. You will soon be the way of the dodo if this is what happens as your whole outlook on business as production as strategy. This is my company, Warrior Poets. Today, about a third of our business, 30% is film, 30% is television, 40% of what we do, all of what we do, is digital. And, to, and this year, probably going into 2016, that will most likely jump above 50%. There is a huge jump on where our focus is as a production company. And if you want to have a company, if you want to grow as a company, this needs to be your focus. This has to be a part of your strategy. Years ago, 16 years ago, I started my first company where the whole idea of the company was we're going to create programming online. It was an amazing idea back in 2000. So I created my very first show. It was a show called I Bet You Will that I launched on the worldwide interwebs that we then sold to MTV. And we ended up doing 53 episodes. Started online, sold it off to film and television. Novel idea back in 2000. But on the heels of that, I said this is, this is, that's where I saw 15, 16 years ago of where we should be making content. Here's what's coming. We already believed in it, I believed in it, and now it's all come to fruition. We did Hulu's first original series, a show called A Day in the Life, which started online, then we sold around the world. 
to traditional television networks. Same thing, we did a show for Yahoo called Failure Club, their first long form original series, which premiered online, distributed around the world. Mansum, a spin-off of the movie we did with Will Arnett and Jason Bateman, which we then spun off into a series for Yahoo. We did 250 episodes online, consumed around the world. Losing It, our show with John Stamos, premiered on Yahoo, on the worldwide internets, now coming to television. We took Connected, an Israeli TV series, to AOL, to the worldwide internets, then back to television. We're now working with Maker, where we've created seven original series, which will go online, on your smartphone, on your tablet, wherever it is, and then we will sell that back to TV. It's a test bed. We've created a place, and now is the most unique place, to try programming. I can launch it online. I can see what people think. I can find out if it's going to pilot well. Are people testing? Are they liking it? Is it watching? Do I get an audience? Now you can do that in a very affordable way before you ever take things out to the marketplace. It's fantastic. And the biggest part is this was all part of our DNA from the beginning. It was part of my DNA. It was part of our corporate DNA. It was already part of what we believed in from day one, minute one. And for you, your digital strategy should already be a natural extension of your current pipeline. Whatever you're making, whatever you're doing, whatever you believe in, whatever you are actually creating, that's your bread and butter, should be your digital focus moving forward. That's where your efforts should be going into 2016. This is you. You got great hair. And a really long neck and strange arms. But the goal is for you to build a bridge between what you're currently doing now and your digital content, an easy fix. This is most network's executives. You can tell by the question marks that float above their heads and the X'd out eyes. The amazing thing, and I'm sure there's probably some commissioners in here and people who work for, for big networks, and most of you will probably agree with me, most networks don't have digital strategies. Hard to believe. The more people you talk to around the world, they don't have a focus of where they should be taking their content or what their plan is digitally. And that's where you come in as a content creator because you have the ability to help them build that magical bridge above those incredible floaty clouds to digital nirvana. Content creators have the ability to help networks understand what you can deliver and what they need to get to the digital marketplace. But what content is most in demand? This is the hard thing to focus on. Where, where do I focus my time? Where do I focus my effort? If you go back to this list of where we are, here's what excites me the most. So you look at this. You look at the 55-year-olds, 45-year-olds, and I, I produce content in here for the 45 to 54-year-olds. That's me. That's the world I live in. I'm a 45-year-old handsome man with a mustache. But as you go down this list, this is the world I love the most, right here. If you look at this 16 to 24 year old, even into the 25 to 44, but especially this, 16 to 24 year olds, where they're consuming almost 70% of their content digitally. Almost 70% of what they watch is on their phone, is on their tablet, is on a computer. They aren't watching television. And who do I love the most out of that group? Are them. I love young women. I love millennial women because they have so many attributes that are, stop laughing. I'm a married man with a baby on the way. It's not, it's not what you're thinking. These are smart, neglected women. Because here's what I, when you talk about what do you love in the marketplace, like what do I do, what's your effort? And for me, most people will want to chase success in the marketplace. What I believe in chasing is neglect. You should chase the holes in the marketplace. And there is a hole that surrounds millennial women in a large way that they aren't being dedicated to, that there isn't programming that's focusing on what they believe in. And what is the awesome thing about them? Well, there's so many things. One. They're the most educated generation in the history of this entire planet. 65% of them are enrolled in college, with more than half being women. They're going to be 25% of the global workforce by 2020. Two-thirds earn as much or more than their partner. They represent $840 billion in annual purchasing power. More millennial women watch Sunday night football than the bachelorette. God bless them in every possible way. They use multiple screens simultaneously. They're consuming content in every way you can imagine. 
and they share content constantly. This is a huge one, because especially in a world where we're fighting against marketing, how do we share, how do we get words out? These are your evangelists. These are the people you want sharing, talking, getting everything that you make out into the universe. That's what I love about them. In our partnership with Maker, we've done some incredible things, but what I love is the three shows that I'm gonna share with you right now. The very first one is a brand new show called Present Tense. Let's take a look. I'm exploring the issues that matter to me and my generation. I guess I'm gonna do this. You are. Okay, I'm I don't know do what you're getting me into, but I I'm excited. I'm getting you into a world of glitter and fabulosity. Immersed in technology. You take selfies for two hours. That's incredible. And connected to each other like never before. In a sense, like the whole community is creating it. If it's a reflection of its surroundings, it's because the community actually has a hand in its creation. What shapes our identity? What does that feel like? I mean, seeing you walk down the street, they know your religion and your beliefs. How does that make you feel? What defines our future? There's still this large cultural perception that the internet's magical alternate reality where nothing you do matters. They don't know how serious it can be. You're telling me people are eating crickets. Yeah. Ah! Sorry. Oh, okay. boy. So you infuse marijuana into your butter and then into your cooking. Got it. What's the question? What am I doing? <laughs> twerking is just one of the words in the vocabulary of violence. We twerk, we shake, we wiggle, we wobble, we bust it open. So who doesn't like, you know, yeah, the art of, of ass? Sweating. Sweating profusely. When did you get censored? Well, when I came out as trans. When so it was they... when you said, like, this is now my body as a woman. There's this whole other culture of people living differently. Domeland? Welcome to wow, Domeland. This is incredible. <laughs> In America, they, they keep showing that word freedom. I feel that everyone is just out there trying to figure out how to squeeze more money out of us. Why do you dress in drag when you're already a female? I have never been more comfortable being a woman than I ever did. Whoa. Hi, hey, drag daughter. This generation now has the opportunity to think a little bit more critically, and I think that they are. By exploring the social fabric that weaves our digital age, I'm revealing the stories and the people behind the topics that surround us every day. Now, why do I love Jillian Rose Reed and what Present Tense represents? Well, again, I talked about creating content that is within your DNA, that lives within your DNA. Like, I've made a career about immersing myself into worlds that are different than mine, sharing it with the world, creating a, a, a path to empathy. What she does is something like I do. We're putting someone in a scenario and in a show that already is a natural extension of what we create, that what we do. And you will be hard pressed to find immersive journalist female storytellers. Like this is like, if you go in the United States, you turn on television, it's like there's Lisa Ling and there's like no one else in the US. Like what she is doing is incredibly unique and now she's doing it for a brand new, incredibly powerful voice of young women around the world. And I love that. Our next show, which I love, is a, is a show called Sexish. So the goal behind Sexish, if many of you may remember Real Sex, the show that was on HBO, which um, some of us probably saw. Um, I watched it quite a bit as a young man. Um, but now is how do we translate that to a new audience, a new younger audience? And here is our, our answer to that. Hey guys, it's Megan Tonjes, and you are watching Sexish. Talking about sex can be super awkward. So let's do it together. Just get ready to be a little bit confronted. If you're having sex, if you are interested in sex, this is the easiest way to get that education and not feel like you're being judged. I'll go out, I'll ask the questions, and we'll hopefully learn. I got no shame. Welcome to Sex at a Go-Go. I am your hostess with the mostest, Dirty Lola. Hey. Adults need sex ed class because the current state of sex ed in America is appalling. I have titties full of questions. Love it. I get emails or messages on Twitter asking, for me, it seems very simple questions. What nutritional value does sperm have? You wouldn't survive in the forest. Exactly, you can't survive on it. 
which it's like, this is why we keep doing the show. How many sexual partners is too many for a woman? The number that is important to know is zero, because that's the number of That you need to be giving, exactly. I want people to know that normal is relative. It's whatever is good for you. And I, I want people to have a positive experience around sex. Today I'm heading out to meet up with Lude Alfred Douglas. He is a transgender burlesque performer. I do burlesque in a queer historical context and I use the inherently political vehicle of a trans body. What are some of the shitty questions that you get asked? I have met both trans men and trans women and they get all the time, so you're trans. So like, are you full trans? <laughs> I have never gone up to a stranger and asked, what do your genitals look like? Because that would be a ridiculous thing to ask. So it's, it's only polite to not make assumptions about that kind of thing and not make assumptions about what people are comfortable and not comfortable talking about. I am heading to hang out with Kelly Shabari. She is an amazing plus size adult entertainer. Do you feel like having those photos out there has helped you deal with certain parts of your body that maybe you weren't as comfortable with? Yeah. If you see way more varied de depictions of the female form, I think it actually helps you go, oh, why am I picking myself apart? Yeah, why am I freaking out? Yeah. We're so critical of every single part of our lives that it takes that one step to make you start questioning everything else that you're critical of yourself. I'm ready. Yay! I'm scared, Excellent. but I'm ready. Excellent. Boy, yeah, are no, you I sure about this? Yeah, I'm sure. It's, it's surprising that I'm as comfortable as I am right now because I feel like this is miles away from anything that I've done. When I'm in situations like this, I think about like 13 year old me and like how I never would have been able to see myself as beautiful or anything like that. And so the fact that I'm here now and, I, and I'm able to say yes to something so incredible and, and, and feel empowered by that is really special because I feel like it pushed me forward in my journey. Gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. And I love this show. I love Megan Tonjes because for the first time ever, here's a body positive show. Here's a sex positive show that isn't a game show, that isn't a competition, that's about someone who is confronting so much about her own life and her own inhibitions in such a beautiful, honest way, and sharing that with an audience on a global scale is going to be transformational. So for me, I think this show has so much potential, and this is, this is only the beginning for this and for Megan. And the last show we're gonna talk about is something that I'm incredibly proud of, um, that I think is going to just really it's going to explode once it kind of hits the, the distribution universe. And this is a show called What We Teach Girls. My education is very important because it will make me what I want to be. I want to be involved, really involved with social justice. I like MMA because it teaches me confidence. I want to go to charm school to learn how to be a proper lady. If you look through your journal on page seven, what are the most common STDs? Human papilloma virus is the most commonly acquired STD. And can condoms stop you from getting that? No. 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 The Bible says that having sex before marriage is a sin. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven and live my life for an eternity with God. Thank you so much for being with us this evening on our 20th anniversary of our Utah Dance Sports Championships. The boy is the one that does the leading in the dances and the girl's supposed to follow. And it shows how the boy is more the masculine, the more showing off. And then the girl is just like really pretty and really feminine. And I love it about the lady. A lot of these things are really scary. I think it's important for you to like let your voice out because if you don't let your voice out, then no one's gonna know that we need any help.
When you look at these collectively, you start to understand kind of the, the mission, the mandate, the direction we're going. Um, empowerment isn't just something we say. Empowerment is something we control. It's something that we have the ability to actually put out into the universe in such an incredible way. And it's not just about producers, it's about programmers, it's about commissioners, it's about, it's about the heads of networks. And, and we need to take the risks to be brave enough to put things like this out. The problem is up till now, had we not had a digital partner like Maker, a show like this wouldn't have gotten made. We wouldn't have done it. And so because of the ability for us to kind of have that landscape to take those chances, we can create opportunities like this for stories that need to be told. Now, the multi-million dollar question that everyone has. So you're doing all this digital content, but how do I make any money? Because ultimately, you make all this digital content, you don't make any money. Well, for me, it's not what it's about. And it's, it's not what it should be about for you. The biggest thing for you is it should be about, how do I not lose money? And so long as you're not losing money, you're winning. And that's what you have to change your mindset to being. Ultimately, so long as you aren't like going into the black, you're going into the red, so long as you are cash flow positive and creating content that you can put out for people to see that will make a difference, you are winning. From a producer standpoint, from a network standpoint, from a commissioning standpoint, it doesn't matter. Like that's ultimately what it comes down to. And for us, there's multiple ways how we do that. There's, if you look at what we do, so we create content online that's gonna go out no matter where they consume it. And it can go one of two places. We have the ability then to spring that content off in places where it can actually be more profitable to television, to cinemas as we spring things off into movies. And simultaneously, when I make a TV show or I make a movie, I have the ability to do the inverse. I have the, to actually, the absolute reverse of that where I can take it now back to digital and create something that can become more monetizable, that can actually create more money. MIP this year is all about the power of fans. And this is something that I think is also very important when we're talking about digital content. We were one of two vendors that were brought on by Lucasfilm and Star Wars to create original content around the release of their story, around the release of the last film. We did about 80 episodes of original content, about a third of which launched when the movie came out, another third which is coming out like right now around the launch of like the digital and DVD, another third which is coming out later. These people became the greatest advocates for us. Those fans, those people that we talked about, and had, what we made had zero to do with the movie, it had everything to do with the fandom, everything that was around what makes Star Wars so awesome and so special and what I love about it. And so we had them become our greatest marketing tool. Same thing happened when we did Losing It with John Stamos. We partnered with someone who was a real influencer, somebody who already had a following that became our greatest advocate to push out the idea of that show. When we partnered with GE, a huge corporation, a huge brand to do the Focus Forward film series, we had a company that now was behind us to give us their marketing muscle so it wasn't our responsibility. And with what we teach girls, we're about to announce a partnership that will do the exact same thing that is gonna be incredibly exciting, where there will be a driving force behind that that isn't my dollars and it isn't a, a, a network's dollars, it's going to be something really fantastic It's gonna push that out in a way that is inherently natural in a, in a marketing and in a press standpoint. Visibility is credibility. And that's the one thing that I learned when I was making the greatest movie ever sold, where a, a publicist said to me, the greatest thing you can do is be out there in the universe. And as you continue to create this type of digital content, the more visible you make that content, the more credible you become as a content producer. And that's the most important thing. Thank you guys, I appreciate it, thank you. And now, the amazing, Diego Bunuel, coming to the main stage. How are you? Great sure. presentation. Thank you. Morgan. Really wonderful. We should have filmed this and make money with it, you know, <laughs> put it online. and Made tens of dollars. <laughs> tens of dollars. Tens of nickels <laughs> that'll make. So I'm the guy with the, you know, no, the question marks and the crossed out eyes. I'm head of uh, content for uh, Canal+. Plus. And I think that obviously Morgan's presentation is very clear. I mean, I don't think that I have anything to ask really about it because it's what I'm interested in also is really trying to find out with you, Morgan, about, you know, we, we understand this whole digital trend that you're pushing and how we can make it bounce and so on and so forth. Yeah. The question is, and I think it goes back to the original slide you had, was how do you convince the networks and how do you get them? So what is your way in, in a way. Well, I mean, I think ultimately when you talk to networks is the writing is on the wall. I think all you have to do is show them everything that's happening of what they're watching, of where people are consuming content. The one slide that shows 65, 70% of 16 to 24 year olds watching content not on a TV should make them wake up. 
because if they don't, then they're going to be out of a job. That's yeah. the reality. And, and we live in a time now where the, that you have to embrace this digital strategy in a way if you ultimately want to survive. And I think that as a content producer, the, the easiest way to come in and convince someone is if you're already making something to say, we can produce ancillary content for you that will do X. So there's already part of, part of our production strategy is already delivering content that will, ta that will basically tail end off of that content. So I'm already delivering you something that will complement what I'm making in a way that makes it easy for you to say yes. Yeah, but you say that, but on the other hand, everything you're doing right now, you're doing it with people who are not broadcasters. You know, maybe Maker Studio, maybe Yahoo, AOL, and so on and so forth. Go 90. Go 90, yeah. yeah. Is, it, is that, is that the, the, I mean, would you be the first one to actually make that, uh, to be able to make that switch to bring it onto a, a network? To bring a show, well, I mean, you got to look, the very first show we ever made, I Bet You Will, was the first show ever to go from the web to television. Mm. I mean, this was 16 years ago when we took I Bet You Will from the internet to, to MTV. So it's not a new thing. I think that people are, people are ready for that to happen and they want that type of content to bridge that gap. The question is, is how can you how can you make them want to spend less for something more valuable? The Hulu show that we made, which when we made the the, you know, the Day in the Life series for Hulu, we produced that at a very specific price point. Season one was about sixty five thousand dollars an episode for twenty two mm -hmm. minutes. Season two was seventy five thousand dollars an episode. Um, and the goal for that was we wanted to be first. We wanted to plant the flag for Hulu. We wanted to help them know that they could create content in a new space that they could say we're doing this in a way that didn't kind of break the bank. And, and that show sold around the world. You know, we had Fremantle as a sales partner. They took that out around the globe and it's, it's airing all over the planet still. So I think that people, people see the opportunity. It's up to us as content producers to help convince them that it's economically, an economically smart opportunity. Now, you, you've spoken of different types of shows and formats and so on and so forth. Everyone is super hyped by VR. I mean, yeah. do you see VR happening somewhere? Absolutely, is, no, yeah. like VR is a big piece of our, of our production puzzle moving forward. We have two VR projects mm -hmm. that will most likely be announced in the next year. What I love about VR as a nonfiction storyteller is twofold. One is I think it, it's an, it enables you to kind of suddenly be in a place that you couldn't be. But ultimately I look at v, VR as an empathy machine for what I do, where I try to take you in, in, on a journey and put you in someone else's shoes and kind of experience the world through someone else's eyes, now I can do it in a way that will make you understand exactly what they go through on a daily basis. And if you can really put great storytellers in a combined format with VR, so it's not just I put a camera in a room, but I'm actually able to tell a bigger narrative arc story that makes me, makes me really appreciate and for the first time ever be empathetic towards somebody else's plight, it will, be, it, will, it will change everything. But that's the big question with VR, no, is how do you manage the storytelling in a 360 environment? I mean, is that something that's hard to kind of consider or, or perceive? Or? I, think it's, I think it's hard, I think with stuff that's host-driven, I think with stuff that I do, it's an infinitely easier fix. I think where things aren't host-driven, it becomes a harder question of how do you, how do you make that happen? Um, so I think that that's, that's where it becomes. Like, so do you start off with just having somebody who is kind of immersed in that world, who you trust, who's kind of holding your hand into this story, um, and whether that's someone like me or someone else, I think that's, an, that's an, easy, an easy bridge to have happen. Now, the other thing also is with this millennial generation that yeah. you're very attached, uh, and, and we should all be, because it's our future. <laughs> so if they fail, we all I fail. I believe the children <laughs> are our future. He can sing also, <laughs> my God. Um, the, um, the thing also is that everyone says, I mean, I'm in the network, and everyone says, oh, these people, they don't pay for content, so yeah. we're not going to do stuff for them. How do you get to the transfer in between what you're doing and getting them to pay for content, or is it all free and sponsored, which is, I think, another well, valuable thing. Well, I think sponsored is a big piece of this. Um, you know, and as a, as a doc filmmaker, which we were, I was just talking with my partner about earlier today, as a doc filmmaker, oddly enough, I'm very pro-piracy because as a doc filmmaker, if anybody wants to like download and share a documentary for free, God bless you. Um, that you want to actually show that doc to anyone. Now, from a, from a content maker of somebody who paid it, I can understand where Canal Plus or someone would be unhappy that somebody is download, downloading that for free um, because ultimately that's taking money out of like a real network pocket. That's where I think the idea of branded entertainment is so valuable and so important because brands are now not so precious. There was a time when we made Greatest Movie Ever Sold a few years ago where we were chasing brands to sponsor that movie where everybody was so precious about what their brand stood for and what that represented. That's going away now. Brands are realizing that 30 second commercials don't work. These ty this type of advertising they normally do doesn't work. How can they connect with you in a way that is really emotional, that's really pure, that is an alignment of ideologies? Like my brand stands for X, this content stands for X. I don't have to load it with people drinking things in the middle of it going, hello, you know, <laughs> to make you feel like you're getting something valuable or me feel like I'm getting something valuable. 
Uh, it's all about the story. And so long as you can tell a good story, brands are now willing to go along that ride. And I think that you're going to find even more brands. And, and the way I look at it is there's no difference between NBC Studios or Paramount Pictures or Coca-Cola Presents X um, if they're not like shoving brands down my throat over the course of production, then it's, then it's all about story and, and people understand that. Well, I think that's very important what you're saying because, for example, on our channel, the big problem is to try to get MG's minimum guarantees at the tail end of the production because that helps to finance the shows. And obviously, everyone says DVD market's dead, you know, ETC's not selling enough. And so I did the same thing. I started going toward brands and everyone in France is like, oh no, you can't have brands coming because it's the devil and they will corrupt your product. I'm like, well, you can't put the, you know, you can't put your product in it. You have to yeah. agree with the philosophy of what we're doing. And so long as they have no creative say in the final product, I mean, they have to buy in to the creative voice and vision of whether it's a commissioning editor or a filmmaker to say, I believe in you and I believe in what you stand for and I'm going to take the bet that it aligns with what I believe. And could it blow up in their face at some point? Sure, of course it could. Anything could. But I think that brands realize they have to, they have to be willing to take the same risk that networks uh, are willing to take now. Now, a lot of the examples you've shown here um, are really focused around the individual in their, in their immediate environment. It's yeah. uh, like a personal experience. Uh, it speaks, obviously, to that generation. How do you get shows to talk about big issues? I mean, obviously, what we teach girls is part of the big issues. But yeah. environment. Now, Everyone's like wrecking the breads, like how can we talk about environment without people wanting to either shoot their heads off yeah. or fall asleep? And is that something that you're trying to work on these big issues and how to get this generation interested? I think the in more the more personal you can make a big issue, the more personal it will become to the viewer. I think ultimately it has to be, it has to be experiential. It has to be I have to see me and who I'm seeing. I have to see me in that story. The minute I see me and and that's why you know I think a lot of the stuff that I've done. Um, in terms of immersing myself into whatever, whatever films it is or TV shows like 30 Days or Inside Man connects with audiences because I'm taking you on this vicarious journey where suddenly I become you. And just by me becoming you, you're, in, you're into this world where I'm now understanding what this person goes through in a very unique way. And it doesn't have to directly relate to my life, but, it, but it's enough to where it makes me understand it in a way that will have an impact. Mm -hmm. And so... Basically, this, this America's soft power, which is this culture, which spreads worldwide, and you, yeah. you did a very strong point at the beginning of it with these moronic shows, I'm sorry to say that, but I do believe it. Yeah, but now, like but a now crime the, against humanity. But the, but the beauty is now it's changing. I know, Because I know, I know. now what will happen on the heels of these smarter shows coming out, all of the networks now are betting on smarter shows across the board. Discovery, Nat Geo, HBO, Netflix, all the way down, AMC, they're all betting on smarter nonfiction fare, and that will become the next franchise that's going out around the globe, which will be huge. So the fact that now there's a huge bet and a huge push of, of coming out of like production in New York City and, and LA and beyond in the United States is going to really have a, a it's gonna be a, a tsunami of a wave impact on, on television and, and production around the world. What's very interesting is that you have that on, the, on on the other hand, you have Trump also making great <laughs> scores. So. Hopefully he doesn't have an impact on the world. Okay. That's the hope. Let's, uh, yeah. let's get some questions from the audience. Um, who, uh, we've got Morgan Spurlock, straight from New York City. Ah, we've got one in the corner here. Hi, Rachel Morrell from the MIP News. You've spoken very eloquently about um, girls as viewers and you've got some great girls as presenters yeah. have you been able to get women young women behind the camera in your offices how do you do it and what do you suggest to other people That's, to do that uh, like uh on national women's day i tweeted out of all the power the the power women of warrior poets who uh i think now we have something like 20 20 women working in our office in in real positions of influence from development to production etc i think it's imperative i think you have to um, and we've got you know, people and voices from around the world. I think you have to make that part of your production strategy. A part, you can't just make it, you have to walk it. And part of our goal is to walk the walk and talk the talk about who's standing behind the program when we make. This amazing series um, was directed by a, a brilliant female film, filmmaker. Um, and, you know, it wasn't myself or, or any of uh, the other guys in the office. Um, you know, Corey McKenna is a spectacular editor, filmmaker, producer. So I think that uh, you need to have those people be a part of the strategy, especially if this is the type of stories you want to make. And, and we seek those people out. Like whenever we put a call out for interns or producers, um, you know, we want to make sure that we constantly have that balance of voices and, and, and brain juice in our office so it's not so male dominated because we live in an industry that is very much male dominated. 
Yeah, we're two guys on the stage here. <laughs> but you're <laughs> a handsome man. Yeah, well, that doesn't, unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't change anything. <laughs> I'd have to go further for that. Another question for Morgan. Yes. A couple. Thanks. Uh, great talk. I loved it. Um, you talked about stories that need to be told, and yes. you talk about smart content. How do you make the choices? Is it very personal to you and the people you work with, or do you have some form of philosophy or driving principle? Um, I mean, I think that uh, you know we try to create a balance of things that are mindful and playful. We tried to create it as, as you know that was identified, and if you saw the greatest movie ever sold, is kind of what our core brand identity is. Um, and so that is really much what our I think our company stands for. And we try to find things that'll make you laugh, but at the same time make you think. Um, we want to create a conversation, and it is things that we are passionate about. There'll be things that. Um, whether it's Rachel Traub, who's uh, you know our our new director of of fiction and nonfiction development, she'll come into the office and be like, "Oh my God, I just read this thing. You have to read it," and it becomes a real conversation in our development meetings. Um, or it's something that that's just eating away at us. It's like we should do a story about X or Y. Um, it, it's we we it's an open dialogue. But there are things that I think become very passionate to our team in New York City. Uh, my producing partner and COO, Jeremy Chilnick, who's right here. He's the very handsome man who's waving right there. Stand up, stand um, up, stand, please, Stand Jeremy. up, Mr. Chilnick. Stand up, Mr. Chilnick. This is my COO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. But, um, but it's, you know, we, we very much uh, try to find the balance. Uh, we, we don't like to be so reactive, because I feel like the minute you're reactive to things that are happening in the media, um, then you're chasing stories that everyone suddenly is chasing. We like to find things that I think are much more inherent to not only the culture of our office, but the culture of our beliefs. Another question here? Um, what kind of running times are you working on with these? Especially, uh, I'm interested if you're looking to package this for television later on or something. Yeah. You know, uh, online tends to be a shorter running sure. time. So that's a, that's, a, that's a very great question, because part of what, we, what we're doing with our digital content is, is shaping it all now for repackaging. Like, so if you look at what we teach girls, um, those episodes will run anywhere digitally from you know, seven to 11 minutes, um, and then we will repackage those into 22s for a half hour format to sell around the world, which is currently available for uh, any uh, commissioners that would love to talk to us about what we teach girls. You can have it very cheaply. Um, as well as uh, present tense, as well as sexish. Like, we're repackaging all of these. The goal for us is to create a very digital delivery platform where people can consume this on their phones, but we also want to make sure that we can springboard this out into the universe. Um, and for us, and for Maker, it's not just about making money. We want to create a conversation. We want to get stuff out where people can talk about it, where people can see it, where people can uh, consume it in a way that isn't happening right now, um, that's a very different and diverse audience than you would typically cater to. That's what you should want. You should want to grow this audience. So what we're trying to do is repackage this and put it out in places where the typical audience that would be watching it online or on their phones isn't getting it. Yes, in the front, one second, Mike's coming. I think that's very interesting also what you were saying about the telcos. The telcos right now are looking for this popcorn formats, you know, which you can snackable, have, snackable, yeah, snackable content. content yeah. That's right. Yeah, this is, this is a little... That mic's off. Hello? Hello? Hello, testing. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit more of a business question, but I'm curious. You obviously control your IP. You must own it. Do you have the opportunity to go get sponsors behind your content, or do you leave that open for your network partners. And a second question that's related in a sense. Yeah. I'm curious about how you split the economics between say the digital presentation versus television. I mean, do you basically try to recoup all your production costs with your first sale and then see the repackaging as the upside? Is that what you were sort of alluding to especially in terms for about? Especially not, for digital, especially yeah, for that's digital. What I'm like, to... I think digital, the repackaging becomes the upside, um, both for us and for a partner like Got Maker. It. Yeah. Um, you know, when we, and, and for us, it's like, whenever we, we have an idea, it's like, where's the best place to tell the story? Like, there's still stories that are meant to be 90-minute feature films, and we're very fortunate that we still can live and operate in a feature film world. Like, we can still make movies. Um, we just sold a movie, Eagle Huntress, at Sundance. We have two movies that are going to Tribeca. So we still make films, and there's movies that should be 90 minutes long. There's movies that should be 60 minutes long or less that should be kind of living in that space of like an hour-long kind of typical TV commission. But then there's things that should be even shorter. There's things that should be 25 minutes, 15 minutes. Where do those live? I mean, that's a digital landscape that is kind of untouched right now, and that's the Wild West. And so that's the opportunity for us to chase sponsors, to find people who underwrite programming in a new, unique way. 
who are, are willing to take chances um, and basically deficit finance the whole thing or, or come on board later once it's already done and say, we'll finance the next season um, on the heels of this. So for me, I think that's what we look for are opportunities that kind of push production and distribution in a different way. Like we've always been early adopters of technology and early adopters of kind of the, the entertainment environment. And I think the more as a producer or as a distributor, you can do that as well, the better it will be for all of us. Yes, question in the back coming. Hi. Um, with Super Size Me, you've been considered uh, the in nearly inventor of the Gonzo documentaries. So, yeah. documentaries very incarnated that can engage an audience, and that has been copied around the world. Well, inspired a lot of filmmakers and channels like Canal Plus in France. Um, but on the other hand, the and I didn't make a penny from that. <laughs> <laughs> but the programs you, you gave as an example uh, yeah. of new intelligent shows are not incarnated. So do you feel that it's still the best way to engage uh, audience to have something very heavily incarnated, or on the other hand, uh, new shows more explicative like? Um, making a murderer, for example. Well, this this is well, this is a great question because what's happened now on the heels of the jinx of making a murderer is I will have calls with networks now where they're like, oh, we'd love to talk to you. We really want to find our making a murderer. So I was like, great. So let's get a time machine. Let's go back ten years, find that murder that's just happening where we can make that work out. Um, but that's so. What happens is again, it's about being reactive. So you see a, lo a lot of these networks that are becoming reactive to what's successful in the marketplace, which is still good for us. As nonfiction producers, as nonfiction creators, it's great because now this is already smarter fare. This is not people like putting on beautiful gowns and dancing on a shiny floor. It's something much more challenging and I think exciting for a nonfiction storyteller. So the, the opportunity for us is grand in terms of what we can take to them. So part of what we need to do is in those moments when they say, well, this is what we want, well, while those type of worlds are, you're, you're threading a very thin needle, is what worlds can you then push them to? Because they want something. These, these programmers, these commissioners, they want something that fits into this landscape, but it doesn't have just to be this. You could push them into this. You could push them into this. You could actually get away to have them agree to things that are still smart and challenging that aren't exactly what something like Making a Murder or Jinx is, but is just as compelling and engaging for an audience. And that's the opportunity that we have and that we need to really jump on. Because now there is a moment in time that is so exciting because we still produce stuff at a lower price point and a lower cost point than any of those scripted shows that are blowing up on every network. We do. Like we, well, our number is still you know, like a half a million dollars and under for like an hour TV. So how can we continue to push them to say this is valuable for us because we can still make more of this, win with an audience, and continue to build viewership. And that's what we should all be doing. That, that should be our directive across the board. Thank you. And let me ask you this about, about the budgets. Like, do people in the States, are, are there a lot of co-productions with Europe? Or is it something that's starting now? I think it's, I think it's happened with bigger networks. I think what you, you've seen it with the HBOs and, and I think the Showtimes, um, you know, partnering with whether it be a Canal Plus or a BBC or a Sky Atlantic, you're going to see more of that now. Because I think there is a much more appetite. Again, like we're catching up with what you guys have known for a long time, which smart nonfiction is great. Good docos are great. People want to see these things. People will watch them. So there, is, there, there will be a greater opportunity now for networks across the board to partner with people, um, I think, that are outside of a, of a typical US partnership. But that's where the big difference is with the digital, because when you co-pro on a doc for a network, it's yeah. regional, whereas digital goes immediately global. Right. So is there a way to do co-pros for digital, for Totally, example? absolutely. Yeah. And I think ultimately what you're doing is you're both putting, you, you want to say we're going to equally rev share on this um, with kind of the, the filmmakers, of course, because, you know, we made it. We should at least share in there somehow. So we get some sort of a, a carve out as you guys are recouping um, that then you guys will split that equally. And you're, you're equally banking on the cost. You're equally banking on the promotion. But you're also equally banking on the success. So I think there are ways to do that. Great. Okay, I'm told that this is it, guys. Uh, it was a wonderful speech. Thank Thanks for great to for see you, Morgan. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.